So the project is essentially uh, talking, looking at uh, make air quality great again. It's about you know this is a this is obviously a spin on make our planet great again, and our focus is air pollution and air quality, uh, and we want to improve it so that everybody breathes clean air. And uh, so the focus of our project is in Africa, whereas I'll talk about that uh, it's not a whole lot of air quality monitoring. And so when you don't monitor air pollution, then it becomes harder to manage air pollution. And so the uh, and so my collaborators uh, are a research scientist Michael Giordano, uh, post Mopka postdoc Julian Bahino, uh, Carl Meilings, who was a postdoc with us and is now a postdoc fellow at NASA, uh, my uh, partner and collaborator Matthias Beekman, uh, who is the director of OSU Flu and one of the original developers of the Shimmer air quality model. Uh, and uh, of course, there's a whole lot, whole lot of collaborators as well. And uh, like I said, there's a strong team involved. And uh, we, sorry. Uh, so Afrique Air is essentially composed of uh, scientists across Africa. So Kofi Omega is from Ghana, Tim Brown is in Rwanda, Rebecca Garland in South Africa, Jimmy Gasore is also in Rwanda, Paulina, Faye, Albert, are in the US. Emilia is right now in Sydney and Dan is also in the US. And we have a whole host of uh, collaborators and partners uh, from Lisa, Anais Ferron, Paula Formenti, Beatriz Martikarena, uh, obviously a lot of other people, as well as uh, scientists in Ghana, uh, Kenya, uh, uh, South Africa, obviously, and uh, other, other places as well. So a lot of names and if I, and I'm afraid I'll end up missing a lot of them. Uh, I'm sure I'm forgetting some of them, but it takes a big effort to carry out this project and really grateful for all their efforts. Uh, Ezekiel Vigru in particular, uh, the name in blue, he was a student with Professor Michael Gattari and he has now joined our LISA group as a PhD student to do air quality monitoring, uh, sorry, a modeling of air pollution over East Africa as part of our MOPCAR project. And uh, obviously, the most of all the most of the funding is from the ANR Make Our Planet Great Again program. But in the past, I also re received funding from the US EPA, and currently we are part of the NSF CampsNet project. Uh, so a little bit of a diversion at the start. Uh, so this is one of my favorite movies, uh, it's the Sum of All Fears, and uh, toward this is this is obviously a, a story about the nuclear apocalypse. And towards the end, the Russian president. Uh, you know, gives a very nice speech and says, we, it makes what we all live on the same planet, we all breathe the same air. Actually, the one thing that caught was we all breathe the same air. I, I mean, we don't actually. So we all breathe different air in different quality of air. And so it is just uh, a way to sort of this idea that we all breathe the same air, but essentially we don't all uh, experience the same clean air. Some places are definitely cleaner than the others. Though, of course, if we go by the recent WHO guidelines, no place on earth actually breathes clean air, with maybe the exception of Hawaii, maybe, I don't know. Uh, so uh, something to think about. And so the outline of this presentation is essentially, uh, so we'll be talking about, I'll be giving a brief introduction to what is air pollution, how do you monitor air pollution and what, do, and what are low cost sensors? How do we use them? in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, which is a reasonably well-monitored city by conventional means, uh, presenting some results from our Africa network in West Africa, East Africa, and South Africa. And then I'll talk a little bit about where we want to go next based on our results so far. And uh, what I want you to take away from this talk is that number one, low-cost sensors can actually help overcome the air quality data gap in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, but we need to be careful in their use and avoid known artifacts. Uh, we need to invest more in key infrastructure and support local scientists uh, because local buy-in and stakeholder engagement are key to successes of any initiative. And at the end of the day, local scientists are the people who know the needs of their country the best. And so a lot of my work is really guided by my discussions with local scientists who often take ownership of the project in their countries uh, and without whom this project would not be possible. So they need funding and other, sort, other forms of support. And finally, I'll be talking a little bit about how we want to get more traditional forms of air quality and atmospheric chemistry uh, into the mix because low cost sensors are useful, but they don't give us the complete picture. Uh, so a little bit about air pollution. Uh, 
air pollution, uh, the, the Health Effects Institute, based on the global burden of disease, estimates that air pollution is one of, is the largest uh, environmental health risk responsible for almost 7 million premature mortalities per year. Uh, air pollution causes a number of diseases. Uh, and when I say air pollution, there's a whole host of compounds that go into air pollution. The primary pollutant is particulate matter, uh, PM2.5 and PM10. Uh, so this graphic from the US EPA shows a typical human hair about 70, 50 to 70 micrometers in diameter. PM10 is obviously much smaller than that and PM2.5 is even smaller than that. And you can think of PM10 as the aerosols that are smaller than 10 micrometers and that is what you inhale through your respiratory tract. 2.5 micrometers, the aerosol smaller than 2.5 micrometers aerodynamic diameter and they are the particles that make it all the way through your lungs. And uh, they are often uh, organic compounds, black carbon, they come from combustion sources, uh, metals, brake wire, tire wire, you name it. Uh, there is secondary inorganic compounds like uh, ammonium sulfate and ammonium nitrate that are caused by oxidation and uh, of uh, sulfur dioxide and nitrogen dioxide in the atmosphere in combination with ammonia. Uh, and then dust and metals. There are also criteria pollutants like ozone, nitrogen dioxide, which uh, uh, nitrogen dioxide is closely related to traffic pollution or combustion sources. Uh, ozone is the secondary pollutant that's found in the atmosphere. Sulfur dioxide are primary emissions. Uh, but usually the main uh, uh, pollutants that we worry about in most cities are nitrogen dioxide, ozone, and PM2.5. Uh, and they are all re usually regulated by national standards, though a lot of countries have either outdated or don't have any national standards. Uh, the WHO guidelines are usually a good way to go as an aspirational standard that we want to meet. And you might have heard a lot of news recently about how the WHO guidelines were updated after almost 15 years uh, to a level where I think practically no country meets it currently. Uh, so uh, that's air pollution. And the question is, how do we actually measure it? Uh, so the traditional way of measuring it, and this is a picture from Rwanda, uh, and uh, this was the first reference air quality monitoring station in Rwanda, and those are my uh, colleagues, Jimmy Gasore, uh, Professor uh, Michael Gattari, and Theo Habineza, and they're showing us these reference monitors inside the station. So it's, a ref it's an air-conditioned shelter containing very expensive equipment, ten to $30,000 for each instrument. Uh, they are quite accurate with frequent maintenance. Uh, but because of the high cost of capital cost as well as high operating costs, even in, our, in our cities like Paris, there are very few of these stations. So for example, this is the Paris map from OpenAQ and in a population of about 12 million people, there are 12 or 13 air quality monitors that measure PM2.5 and NO2. Uh, and so it's about one monitor per million people. Uh, and uh, so the question is, a lot of African countries don't even have these monitors. Now, Rwanda has this one monitoring station, and a few other countries do. South Africa is reasonably well equipped, but many countries don't have it because it, it's expensive. It takes a lot of maintenance. Uh, there are other infrastructural problems there. And so one way that we were, before this uh, reference monitoring station went up, uh, we went into Rwanda and we used low cost sensors and I'll talk about that later in the presentation. Uh, so low cost sensors, you might have all heard about it. You might have seen the purple airs or other uh, consumer grade devices that you might buy recently. These are typically $250 to $10,000 depending on what configuration you buy. Uh, they, are, they have a very small footprint. So you can see this device right here in the background. So compare it that to the, uh, let's see if I can actually use my pointer. So compare this device here to this entire station over here. So this, this instrument also monitors PM2.5, uh, NO2, ozone, SO2, sulfur, uh, so on and so forth, similar to what this station also measures. So it's a much smaller footprint. It can be solar powered, but they're also, they're also affected by temperature relative humidity because we're not really air conditioning the sensors. Uh, and they're, the, the sensors can also be cross sensitive to non target species. So we need to account for all of these uh, correction, all of these uh, interferences. Uh, so the monitor that I'll be talking about is the real time affordable multi pollutant monitor or RAM. Uh, now, a lot of similar boxes exist on the market, but when I started this research uh, at Carnegie Mellon in 2015, 2016, uh, I didn't find a box that was actually affordable for us, as well as I did what I wanted it to do. 
And so I collaborated with Sensevier, which is a small private company in Pittsburgh. Now they're owned by Sensit. And we they developed the hardware for the ramp, which essentially is electrochemical sensors uh, for the gases and an optical nephelometer for PM2.5. And so this is the one station here. So, you know, uh, that's Alexei, the, the ramp network manager holding this monitor in this box. So that's the size that you can see. And so you published a lot of papers on the calibration and use of these sensors that I'll talk about. Uh, and the way that we usually calibrate it is by co-location. So the first approach is obviously lab-based calibration. This is what you do with traditional monitors. And you expose the sensors to set quantities of calibration gas at one or more temperature and relative humidity conditions. Uh, and then, but unfortunately what you find is that these lab-based calibrations don't really work very well in the real world. Uh, so the green bars are what you, the accuracy that you get the precision and the bias error with the lab-based calibration and CO is not bad, but NO2 is almost 100% precision error, 200% bias error. And so the other approach is to co-locate these sensors in the location where, you're, where you want to use them here in Pittsburgh. Uh, and next to a reference monitoring station here, it's the Carnegie Mellon uh, Mobile Air Quality Lab. And so we, we co-locate them for three to four weeks. And then we map the, the response of these sensors to the accurately measured uh, pollution concentrations from the reference monitoring network. And we include temperature, humidity, and other factors into a random forest model, which is in the magenta. And we find that the precision and the bias is significantly improved by use of this field approach with machine learning techniques. So, and now for PM2.5, uh, now most consumer grade PM2.5 monitors that you see on the market, they are optical nephelometers. And uh, the thing with, uh, with optical nephelometers, which just measure aerosol scattering, is that at uh, high humidity, 70, 80, 100% relative humidity, uh, the sensors uh, can, can report twice as high. So here, for example, the purple air as reported data on the y-axis and the reference monitoring station on the x-axis. And uh, you can see that at higher humidity is the purple air reporting twice as much PM2.5 as the reference monitor. And this is because the reference monitors and the standards are based on dry aerosol controlled relative humidity and temperature. And so we need to correct for that using some empirical function, either if, is it if we use a hygroscopicity correction because we need the aerosol chemical composition in Pittsburgh, or we use an empirical correction, and then we can bring that, we can correct for that bias due to humidity, uh, hygroscopic, aerosol hygroscopic growth. Uh, and again, so, so don't use uh, sensor data PM2.5 as is because at high humid, humidity conditions, you may actually end up overestimating it significantly and then people get scared. Nobody wants that. Uh, now a little bit about the application in Pittsburgh, and this will give you a context of how we can use it eventually versus what we are doing currently in Africa. Uh, and so this is a picture from, I think the fifties or the sixties on the left and uh, more recently in the last five years on the right. And there's the same view and Pittsburgh back in the 50s and 60s obviously was very polluted. You couldn't see the sun during the daytime. With decades of work by the US EPA, constant monitoring and air quality management, we are now in a much better situation. Uh, but even then there are still industry in Pittsburgh, near Pittsburgh, there are a lot of environmental justice communities and overall Allegheny County is currently in, was a non-attainment for PM2.5 sulfur dioxide and ozone. And so uh, we decided to see what a network of sensors could do for us in a reasonably well-monitored city. And so we deployed about 50 ramps across Pittsburgh in an area where the squares show the reference monitors. There are five of them measuring continuous PM2.5. And uh, there are 50 ramps also reporting PM2.5, so a factor of 10 more dense spatial resolution, uh, spatial uh, density sampling. And most of the sites, the sites were selected based on traffic density, building heights, restaurant density to build land use regression models. Uh, we uh, worked with local groups like the Group Against Smog and Pollution, the Clean Water Action, and uh, worked with school teachers and residential volunteers who just heard about it and said, I want a monitor at my house. And so, uh, broadly, I think this is a, a major highlight from this study is that in Pittsburgh, uh, the wind directions are typically, there's a wind rose here, and the wind uh, uh, typically comes to the south, southwest, or west directions. And uh, 
or northwest direction. And uh, so if you look at the PM2.5 here on the y-axis from the wind is coming from the south versus uh, on the x-axis, the wind is coming from the southwest or west. Uh, some sites see about the same levels of PM2.5, but there are some sites which see as much as 70% higher PM2.5. And there's this a range across the city. Uh, and so if you map it out across Pittsburgh, you see that the, uh, this, uh, the color of the marker sh shows the difference in PM2.5 uh, when the wind is coming from the south. And you see that most of the sites which see significantly higher PM2.5, five microgram per meter cube or so, are along this corridor right here. And these, these sites don't really see a significant increase, maybe one or two microgram per meter cube. So you see this spatial difference in the impact of some pollution source and of course, there are the steel industry, steel mills, the Claritin Coke ovens is right here. There's a Braddock Urban Valley steel mill and Braddock uh, steel plant are here. And so when the wind is from the south, all of their emissions comes up the river, it goes through this valley and hits these sites, doesn't really hit these sites. And so with, by mapping this pollution, we're able to determine the spatial impacts of a large point source near a major city. Uh, we can also quantify the contribution of the source. Uh, so Rose Eilenberg is a graduate student in mechanical engineering at Carnegie Mellon. She just finished a PhD. Uh, and she determined that uh, so the average annual PM2.5 in Pittsburgh is nine and a half microgram per meter cube in Lawrenceville, which is the urban background site. Uh, Clariton on average contributes 0.3 micrograms per meter cube across all the sites. But when the wind is from the south, on average, it goes up to 1.6 microgram per meter cube on average. But again, there's a range from one to six microgram per meter cube, depending on where you are in the city. Uh, so number one, so you're able to map out the spa spatial impacts of pollution, but you can also quantify what are the contribution of these uh, different sources, uh, of the, uh, quantify uh, the contribution of the source to even at these low levels of pollution, relatively low levels. For context, like I said, the PM2.5 in Pittsburgh on an annual average is nine and a half microgram per meter cube, which was just below the previous WHO guideline of 10 microgram per meter cube. Now it's above it because the WHO guideline is now revised to five microgram per meter cube. So what do we know about air pollution worldwide? Uh, so basically, uh, it's, this is OpenAQ again, which is a wonderful resource for air quality data. And uh, PM2.5 in the top graph, NO2 on the bottom graph. And you see that uh, the US and Europe are fairly well monitored. Europe is very well monitored for both, for both species. Uh, but there are very few monitors in all of Africa. So a lot of low-cost sensors here, the squires are low-cost sensors, uh, a lot of low-cost sensors in Ghana, but still not the density that we see here in the US and in Europe. Uh, and so we have satellite estimates of what is the pollution in these places. And so the y-axis in this graph is the annual average concentration as estimated by satellite retrievals. And the x-axis is the PM2.5 monitors per million people. And this is uh, Europe and North America, the US. And we have about one monitor per million people, like I said, for Paris. Uh, but Africa, Western Africa, Northern Africa, where the PM2.5 is estimated to be about 100 microgram per meter cube, less than two orders of magnitude fewer monitors, maybe none at all. Uh, now, Susan Annenberg did some nice work looking at the most populated cities in Africa and what are the PM2.5 concentrations there. And again, all of these concentrations are well above the WHO guidelines but very few of these cities actually have monitoring except for the cities in Johannesburg, for example. Uh, so we really need to fill this air quality data gap. And the question is, can we do that with low cost sensors? And that was the, uh, quickly about satellites, they provide spatial coverage. Uh, obviously, like I said, those estimates were from satellites. Can they actually just, we can just go by satellites, right? Uh, but what you find is that the sat we, when we have the ground monitoring data from Kigali, for example, this is a diurnal pattern. And the satellite overpass often happens in the middle of the day when pollution is lowest. And so the satellite estimates may be underestimating pollution in these urban cities, which is why we need ground monitoring. And of course, there are cloudy days when uh, uh, you know, satellites cannot provide good data. So again, we need ground monitors for that as well. So they're complementary with each other. Uh, so as part of the MOPCA project, we deployed monitors in many countries across Africa, uh, Kenya, Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, 
South Africa, uh, Niger, uh, Dan Westerveld uh, at Columbia University has deployed monitors in Togo and DR Congo. Uh, Kinshasa, he published a paper recently, we published on that. Uh, so we have a lot of these monitors. Uh, and uh, one of the keys is that while South Africa has reference monitors, we actually had to buy in the reference monitors for continuous monitoring of PM2.5 and NO2 in Abidjan and Accra uh, and Kenya. So uh, many of these cities don't have reference monitors which are required to calibrate uh, the, uh, the low cost sensor. So we have to actually fill that as infrastructure. Uh, so some results. Uh, so this is about a year's worth of data from uh, Abidjan and Accra. So we have three sites, the US embassy has now the State Department, US State Department has started deploying monitors to their embassy. So that's a new resource that came online in 2020 or so for many countries. Uh, so this is the embassy in Abidjan. This is the University of Felix Uh, And then this is the Abidjan City Hall. So where we have two low cost sensors there. Uh, this is the US embassy in Accra. And this is a church. Uh, this is the University of Ghana. This is a interchange, atomic interchange here. Uh, so where we have low cost sensors. And this is a purple air that was deployed by Kofi Omega as part of his Ghana air quality project. Uh, so we looked at, so this is about two years of data, about a year of data, uh, relatively fresh. We just analyzed it over the weekend. We finally had this data, the calibrations and the embassy data basically, and each of these sensors has about 10,000 hours of data over the 13 months, so about a year, give or take. And so, the Abidjan embassy here sees about 25 micrograms per meter cube on median, uh, similar to the city hall, uh, but the university is, seems to be much cleaner. Uh, the uh, Accra US embassy again seems similar to the atomic interchange, uh, but maybe more polluted a little bit than the Kwashimian church, the Zwar, the Zwar Vulu uh, junction, uh, purple air sensor seems to report twice as much PM2.5, but these are uncorrected data. Uh, and so the sensor may be biased high, but so we need to apply those corrections and look at that. And so uh, the first step is that these are interesting results. I mean, we see these differences between the university and the city hall side, uh, that even the patterns are different, right? The box plot shows the median and the 75th and 25th percentiles, and the violent plot shows the distribution of these points. So you can see that the university, there's a lot of low concentration below 10 microgram per meter cube. Uh, the embassy is more usually sees 20 microgram per meter cube. Abidjan City Hall sees a range of concentrations as high as 30 microgram per meter cube, which could be because it's also a heavy traffic site. Uh, and so we can look at the distribution of these uh, of these hourly average concentrations and try to determine uh, what are the temporal variability. So this is still research that is ongoing, but this is finally exciting to see after a lot of hard work that we've been doing, uh, deploying the monitors, calibrating them, and finally now we're getting to look at the data. Uh, so moving from uh, West Africa to South Africa, uh, this is uh, working with Becky Garland, Peter Van Zyl, and Stuart Pickett, and Brigitte Language and others in South Africa. Uh, we deployed two per player monitors. This is actually at Becky's house near Pretoria, Rebecca Garland's house. This is the Wilhelm Research Station. So we deployed per player there. So we have a collocation based on that for two years. Uh, and then we have, this is a, a lower income residential community in Zamdela where Stuart Pickett has a monitoring station. So we deployed ramps there for testing. Uh, we took the collocation at Wellhorn, developed a correction for the purple air, applied it to the purple air and Centurion. And we find that the concentrations at Wellhorn, which is a rural remote site, are about 10 microgram per meter cube, which is a background site as expected. Centurion is a suburban site, closer to 20 microgram per meter cube. So there's obviously more pollution in Centurion, uh, which is expected, but what's surprising, and we are still working on this, is that the levels in Centurion were actually similar to the Shwani market site, uh, which is more in the center of Pretoria. And uh, so uh, it was generally thought that the pollution monitors at the South African Air Quality Network puts are at more polluted sites and the other sites are less polluted, but this, that the per player is reporting similar values as that reference station 10 kilometers away was a surprise. 
And so we really need to do more work on this and see if the low cost sensors can be used to determine the spatial, uh, 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 spatial variability or lack thereof in air pollution, even in a major city like Johann an area like Johannesburg and Pretoria. So a uh, little bit about our air quality work in Kigali. We started this in uh, March of 2017 and went through July of 2018. Uh, at that time, there was no reference monitoring station in Rwanda. And so we deployed in Kigali. And so we deployed the monitors here at the University of Rwanda and one at uh, Gachiriro, which is our residential site. Uh, and so they are about five kilometers apart. And uh, these are the students, they were doing, they were the first batch doing their master's in atmospheric and climate science at the University of Rwanda, which is a program between the Ministry of Education and uh, MIT. Uh, this is Claver Sindhigaya, Sandrine Guhirwa, Valerian Baharani, and Safari Kagabo. And so they took care of the ramp here. Uh, they used the data for their master's project and then we use that data as part of the paper. And so uh, there is a very nice paper that's published in Clean Air Journal. Uh, and uh, so this was the first long-term air quality data for Kigali. Uh, we have over 16 months of data, like I said, uh, several hundred hours of data for most months. Uh, and so for the overlapping months in 2017 and 2018, uh, the blue bars are 2018 and the red bars are 2017. And you can see that there are differences year to year, maybe not statistically significant, but the 2018 seems generally lower pollution for the most months than 2017. And some of this, I believe, was because there was greater rainfall in 2018 compared to 2017, so there is more washout. Uh, and so talking about washout and rainfall, so we actually look at the seasonality of pollution. So this is the wet season, March, April, May of 2017, the dry, long dry season, June, July, August, September. October, November is a short wet season, again, another dry season, another wet season. And one thing you can obviously see is that the dry season sees significantly higher PM2.5 concentrations than the wet seasons. And uh, this is not surprising. Uh, it could be that there is a washout of pollution during the wet seasons, which is why you see lower concentrations during the wet season. Uh, some of that could also be just transported pollution, as I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, the other thing that we can do with, uh, with the low-cost sensors, because we now have uh, high-resolution 15-minute or hourly average concentrations, uh, whereas traditional filter-based methods you give you only 24-hour data, or weekly, weekly concentration. So this is really high time resolution data that we can get from the sensors. Uh, we can look at the diurnal patterns. So this is a typical uh, average day, zero midnight to midnight uh, for the wet season and the blue is for the dry seasons. And we see the typical uh, rush hour peaks, but first we obviously, like I said, the dry season sees significantly higher particulate matter pollution than the wet season that we believe is because of transported forest fire emissions about as much as 20 microgram per meter cube. So if you think about it, you can estimate that uh, looking at the seasonal trend, the, this diurnal pattern here, uh, if you assume that the minimum value here, which is about 20 microgram per meter cube is the regional background and anything higher is from the local, local uh, sources, then the, the local sources contribute about 50% of the PM2.5 in the wet season. But in the dry season, the background is significantly higher because of transported air pollution. And so uh, local sources only contribute 25% of the pollution in the dry season. And so this has implications for air quality management because uh, if you only focus on uh, the local sources, then you will, on, in the dry season, you'll only reduce the PM2.5 pollution by 25%. So you really need to get some regional uh, clean air frameworks into place and work with other countries, for example. That's something that we might need to think about. Uh, and then we also see a sharp dynal profile in PM2.5. Uh, so we see uh, in the more typical, like an urban city, 7 a.m., 8 a.m., 9 a.m., you see these sharp spikes with rush hour traffic. You also see this, uh, the concentrations go down during the day as activities uh, dies down plus the boundary layer expands. And so you have diluted em uh, emissions and lower concentrations. But at night, again, the boundary layer is lower. There is also potentially cooking and uh, vehicular exhaust from the evening rush hour, which, which, uh, which, uh, which increases concentrations overnight. 
and we had a black carbon monitor there as well. And from the wavelength dependence, uh, you can actually determine, suggest that the morning peak is from vehicular traffic and the overnight peak is from vehicles and domestic cooking. So the two major sources in Kigali appear to be cooking and vehicular traffic. Uh, and so that has obviously implications for how we would want to actually approach air pollution and management in the city. Uh, so uh, Kigali also has uh, a nice initiative called Car Free Sundays where major thoroughfares are closed for a few hours, either every su one Sunday each month at the start, or now it's, I think, every other Sunday. Uh, and so when we compared the car-free Sundays PM 2.5 to the regular Sundays PM 2.5, uh, it appears that at the, day, the times when the uh, roads are closed, uh, the PM 2.5 is lower, and so as much as seven microgram per meter cube. Of course, there's still some work to be done, uh, and we also see this uh, effect for black carbon, which is a stronger indicator of combustion emissions from traffic. Uh, so again, the low cost sensors had a very nice uh, uh, insight into what could be the benefits from such car free policies as well. Uh, but again, we need roadside monitors, we need better traditional, more precise air quality monitors to actually do this work properly. Uh, but it's a good start. Uh, a little bit about uh, combining satellite data with the ground data from low cost sensors. Uh, so this, I talked about this slide before. So we had a couple of uh, monitors in Kigali and then we compared it to the satellite data. And the idea was, well, if you had only one monitor in a city, uh, can you assume that that is true for all the city? That's number one. Number two, if you had the satellite coverage, so you had aerosol optical depth, which has great broad spatial coverage, can you calibrate it with the one monitor and use that calibration to determine the pollution at other parts of the city using the AOD over that part of the city? So that's the objective of this study that Carl Mealings published as part of the MOPCA project. So this is the interpolation is basically if there is only one monitor and we assume that it's true for the other side. Uh, and we see the correlation is pretty poor, R squared of 0.1, mean absolute error of about eight or nine microgram meter cube on, on median uh, significant bias. Uh, but if you actually uh, calibrate the satellite AOD to the ground side and then use that uh, sat calibrated AOD at, to determine the PM 2.5 at the other side, you can get improvements in correlation, decreased mean absolute error and smaller bias. And so the hope is that the more low cost sensors we deploy in each city, the better we get at the calibration of satellite AOD to the ground values, and we can get better information uh, about the spatial, uh, uh, spatial variability in air pollution across each city. Uh, now, uh, so uh, we actually deployed a reference air uh, NO2 monitor in Accra, which was the first of its kind. Uh, I think in West Africa, we also have a similar one in Abidjan. Uh, so, we, you know, we, I looked at this data about a year ago, first couple of weeks of data, always exciting to see. And uh, I had June Liu Q at uh, UMass Amherst send me some tropomy data. And uh, correlation is not bad. It's, you know, R, R could be a whole lot better, but at least it looks to be in the right direction. Yay, you know, not bad, right? Uh, then I looked recently at the full year of data and I still need to work on this, but pretty clearly the red markers are the tropomy data and the black line is the surface monitoring NO2. And Obviously, they, they are not very well correlated. There are these uh, high spikes in tropomy NO2, where the ground cell and monitor does not see the spike in NO2, for example. And there's a couple of different spikes like that, which uh, we believe might be related to uh, transported forest fires that are aloft, for example, because tropomy really sees the column uh, uh, concentrations of NO2, whereas you're measuring NO2 at the surface with the ground monitors. Uh, but again, this shows that you can simply do a couple of weeks in a year and just use that as a relation, but you really need to have this extended study. Otherwise you can end up, uh, you know, misinterpreting your satellite retrievals. So this is still again, ongoing work. Uh, but again, uh, one of the things to remember is that these are with reference monitors, which is why we can actually see five, 10 PPB concentrations. Low cost sensors, unfortunately, as we published recently are not very good for below 15 PPB of NO2 concentrations. 
Uh, so we need a combination of low cost sensors and reference monitors uh, uh, to actually know more about air pollution in each of these cities. Uh, quickly about uh, low cost sensor. So again, uh, we, like I said, you can't really use uh, sensors, PM sensors data as reported uh, because the gray bars here are the as reported data and the colors are different corrections applied to the data. Uh, so this is the mean normalized bias, the lower is better. This is the bias corrected CVMAE, uh, mean absolute error. And so the lower is better and the correlation R is higher is better. They all seem kind of similar. Uh, we applied different corrections to it. There, the US EPA recently published a general model uh, based on measurements across the US. We applied that in blue. Uh, the well hern collocation is the one in green. And Zamdela, which is where this study was conducted, uh, is the one in Salmon. And so first of all, you can see that uh, the, the Zamdela specific uh, calibration model uh, almost eliminates bias. Uh, but a, but the other thing is that essentially any correction is better than the as reported data because you get better, you get lower mean absolute error and you get lower bias yeah, as long as you apply some sort of correction. Uh, but uh, correlation is, you know, R of 0.6, not great. Uh, and so the question is, how can we improve it? And uh, so there are different factors that could be affected, affecting this correlation. Uh, and so we'd like to look at it sort of mechanistically so that we're not simply applying a black box magic uh, machine learning model, but actually trying to understand why the relationship between scattering and uh, PM2.5 mass is changes, which could be due to size distribution, uh, which could be due to chemical composition. So again, we need some of these more traditional approaches to actually answer these questions. Uh, and so as part of that, I mean, well, one of the other things that we're doing currently is because a lot of these countries and cities not have any reference monitors. We recently got a gift of 25 PM with reference grade PM 2.5 monitors from the UK. They were being retired from the UK, uh, but they may hopefully still work and they will have a long 10 year lifetime. Uh, I know that the French INDAF network uh, actually, uh, uh, which is basically Beatrice Martikorina, Jean-Louis Rajot, and a whole host of other people. Uh, they actually deploy these PMs in rural areas across Africa. And so they do last a long time. So we're trying to get them working. Uh, our goal is to deploy them in several countries in East and West Africa, which should double or triple the number of reference grade monitors in that region. They will hopefully have a few years of life left, still maybe 10 years, ideally. Uh, they would provide local calibration points for low-cost sensors. Uh, and uh, we would uh, you know, be able to train the local STEM force using these monitors as well. Uh, but obviously we need additional funding for our in-country partners for installation operations. So we are still looking for that. Uh, uh, really quickly, uh, hopefully I still have a few minutes left. Uh, and uh, the, so we talked a lot about, so the title obviously is urban air quality, right? Urban uh, air quality in urban sub-Saharan Africa. But uh, uh, when I was starting the study in Rwanda, we went to rural Tanzania where there is an electrification project with this wonderful group of people who work with Paulina Haramio at Carnegie Mellon at that time. And so uh, this was, these were small villages without any electricity, one of them without any running water. Uh, and so, uh, the and so we I just took a portable PM monitor, battery operated from Met One, uh, ran it for 10 minutes at a variety of locations, uh, trying to see what the pollution was like. And so we see a range of concentrations here. So, number one, obviously, uh, we see that uh, uh, the this indoor cooking here, this where they are cooking indoors. That obviously has the highest, uh, the orange bar over here, PM2.5, almost 200 microgram per meter cube, according to this monitor. Uh, so indoor air pollution is still a huge deal, and that is estimated to cause about 3 million premature mortalities each year, and this is something we need to work on. But even outdoors, we see concentrations from 10 microgram per meter cube to over 60 microgram per meter cube. Uh, and these are, of course, spot checks, about 10, 15 minute measurements, uh, but, uh, it is kind of interesting that this is these are small villages, one of them maybe about 5,000 people, maybe less, and uh, no electricity. They have some a few industrial generators around, but a lot of cooking. 
And between cooking and dust, you see the smoke swirling about in the middle of this village where a lot of kids are playing, people are hanging out because it's a village center. Uh, and so uh, the, you know, and the smaller village actually saw a reported higher PM 2.5 than the larger town. Uh, and so, but we are not really paying any attention to all of these places where people live and they breathe all of this, uh, 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 all of this pollution. And so how can we actually change that, right? And that's something that we really need to consider strongly. Uh, and so uh, I'll conclude with some, uh, with, a, with some ideas. Now, uh, we obviously with the hybrid air quality networks, we hybrid meaning a reference monitoring station and a network of low cost sensors. Uh, we are able to identify spatial and temporal variability uh, across a city, multiple cities in Africa, but we need to correct the LCS data by collocation with reference monitors, but still sensor networks can still identify local and regional sources. They can track trends. So they're really useful that way. Uh, they can highlight areas of, uh, pro of pro potential problems and we can pay more attention to that. But we still need traditional approaches. We need long-term monitoring. We need field campaigns. If I'd gone by the two week, two week comparison with the tropomy data, I'd be pretty happy. But then I look at the year and it's a lot more complicated, which may not be a surprise to people who do satellite monitoring uh, regularly, right? But still, I think it's important that we have these long-term monitoring stations across these uh, cities, uh, gas analyzers. Uh, now, actually getting a gas cylinder in France or the US is pretty easy. You just call up air gas and you know you order the calibration gas you need is delivered in two weeks. But here it, it, there is no manufacturing facility close by and you have to ship a compressed gas cylinder to this country and there is attendant uh, customs hassles and clearances and all that required. So we really need to work on that. Uh, we need to get PM composition because one of the keys in converting nephilometric PM 2.5 to PM 2.5 mass is aerosol composition as well as size distribution. So we need to include that. Uh, and then all of this data will actually be helpful to improve our air quality models uh, that can then be used to, uh, for, uh, uh, to ideate new mitigation policies. Uh, and then of course, uh, for validation of satellite retrievals with long-term campaigns, I believe, uh, I think NASA is trying to do this in Addis Ababa and Johannesburg with the Maya campaign in the next few years. Uh, but we obviously need a lot more long-term monitoring network uh, stations on the ground, and that can be used to, valid, uh, to compare with existing satellite retrievals as well. Uh, we need to really invest in key infrastructure and support local scientists. Uh, we need cutting edge infrastructure so that the next generation of scientists and their quality practitioners can actually uh, learn how to use that. Uh, obviously, uh, there is no, you know, uh, uh, and, uh, and it, we also need to fund research by local scientists. One of my uh, frustrations has been that sometimes US funding agency rules don't really allow funding of research by local scientists in other countries. And uh, obviously these uh, uh, scientists like Kofi Omega and Becky Garland and Michael Guattari are contributing significantly to the project. And uh, they know their country, they know their conditions. Uh, they are, uh, you know, they're very well experienced just like uh, any scientist in the US or France, but we can actually fund them to do research in using some of these rules. And so we need to find better funding models uh, to support the scientists who actually know what the country's needs are. Uh, and finally, this is, uh, you know, uh, I mentioned that, you know, unelectrified rural areas, I didn't think it would be possible, but air pollution can be just as bad as urban areas. That is something that we need to keep in mind. Uh, so with that, I will uh, be happy to take any questions. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, for this excellent talk. Uh, that was really amazing. Um, we already have questions from the audience, so I will uh, start with those. Um, the first one is from Johannes Orthal. Uh, can you please comment on the advantage of your network measurements compared to satellite observations? I think you touched yeah. on this already. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, yes, so so I think satellites are great because you provide spatial broad spatial coverage that just a network of monitors cannot really do that well. You can't have a monitor. Well, 
I think some places in London are actually putting a monitor on every block, uh, but uh, that's not possible. Like that's, I don't know how useful that is in a lot of places, but still satellites are really good in terms of broad spatial coverage. Uh, one of the challenges is that unless it's a geostationary satellite, most satellites only get one snapshot a day. So this might be at 7.30 a.m., this might be at 1.30 p.m., 11 a.m., depending on what is the overpass time of that satellite. And so, that, like I showed in some of our results, uh, this is the time when pollution is lower, and so in the city because of emissions and atmospheric conditions. And so we don't want to bias that low. There are obviously efforts like the Spartan network try to get diurnal profiles of pollution in some cities. There are two Spartan locations in Africa, I think one in Nigeria, one going in South Johannesburg. Uh, or near Pretoria. But again, obviously, Africa is a huge continent. We need a lot more of this ground truthing of satellite retrievals. Uh, there is also the issue that when there is a wet season, there's more clouds in the sky. So you don't really know the pollution on the ground because of cloud cover. And so ground monitors are what help you in that, in that, uh, in that, uh, in that situation as well. Mm -hmm. So Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so we have a, a question from Laurent Alleman. Uh, sorry, uh, and uh, you can now talk. I've uh, unmuted you, I think, or asked to unmute. So anyone who has a question, you can uh, raise your hand. Uh, you can type it in the chat or in the Q&A. And if you raise your hand, I can also enable you to talk. Also, if you're an, an attendee, Laurent Alleman. Okay, maybe he doesn't hear me. I think Chien we'll had a question. Yeah, then we go on to yeah. Chien Wang. <laughs> hey, so, uh, glad hey. to uh, hear your talk again. You look uh, slightly different, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I like your comment, uh, um, the speciation and also size distribution. So I, I remember I used uh, you once found a uh, um, uh, Spartan, a uh, network Spartan, uh, it's a Randall Martin and a yeah. company, uh, Randall. So um, if I remember correctly, it's just a nephrometer plus a set of uh, filters, camera filters. Uh, so the, the thing is for the filter is you have to send to um, Randall's uh, lab to yeah. do the speciation. Uh, of course, you can, you know, you can use uh, Carnegie Mellon, so, you know, if you do that. So I wonder, that's uh, not a terribly expensive. Uh, I wonder, you know, since you're committed to long-term monitoring, you know, things like that would be really helpful because, uh, uh, you know, Navrometer gives you a size, pretty good uh, size. And, and um, the future, the problem with future is integrated. So, but generally speaking, you still have a speciation information. Because one yeah. thing we found that recently for the Africa, um, the biomass burning, um, because of the air, uh, the tra uh, you know trajectory uh, is very very interesting. So sometimes you really you thought you should have a, a background clean air, but you, and you found um, there's a very clear signal of uh, problems coming. So that maybe I think that's probably investment uh, really worthy. Um, yeah, absolutely. And I think you know I think the. Uh, I mean, you made a good point that, you know, currently, I mean, Spartan is great, right? I mean, uh, uh, I think Randall has done a fantastic job over the years, uh, obviously, no question about that. Uh, but again, uh, you know, you collect these filters and then they are, again, they are, you know, at particular times of day and they are a weekly averages, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. And so then you ship it back to Randall's lab and... Yeah. Uh, so local, you know, uh, so if you want how many of those, right? How many of those uh, lab, how many of the samples can his lab analyze? If you, that scale that you need, currently there's just two sites in Africa, which is a population of a billion people, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, I think, I think, but again, that, that's a different objective, right? I mean, it's, it's it, it, you know, that's a very different objective from what we are trying to do, which is actually uh, trying to look at air quality, enabling air quality management in each of these cities. And uh, I think the, 
thing that is now available in the US. So traditionally in the US, again, there were all of these filter-based measurements like the IMPRU and the SDN networks that collected filter-based PM samples for composition, sent them off. Now we have things like the aerosol mass spectrometer or the aerodyne, uh, you know, uh, aerosol chemical speciation monitor that gives you as much as 15 minute time resolution of uh, organic aerosol, uh, ammonium sulfate, ammonium, ammonium sulfate, nitrate ions, thing, you know, whole host of other metals, things like that. And that's really super useful for source apportionment, for doing atmospheric chemistry, for example. Uh, and so what we would really like is, you know, can we get some of those monitors, you know, kind of instead of going through this uh, traditional approach of let's do filters first and in 20 years, get them all, you know, get, uh, let uh, go to ACSMs maybe, why don't we just start with the ACSMs, right? Wow. And so uh, there is an ACSM in Kigali with Jimmy Gasore's lab at the University of Rwanda. Uh, but again, I think uh, the, we need people to be trained properly in its use. Uh, it, the data analysis is not easy, it's complicated. And so I think the students are there, we just need to actually have more labs like that, more groups like that across Africa uh, in each of these major cities. I mean, for example, Lagos, you know, it's, a, it's one of the large, most populated cities in Africa. And uh, as far as I can tell, there are no regulatory air quality monitors there, let alone a chemical speciation. Uh, though I heard something the other day, actually, I don't know if I can talk about that, but. Uh, I don't know the details, but the project's ongoing. Again, the data needs to be public as well. So this is the other thing I didn't actually touch upon. And uh, so trying to make the data as open as possible. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, getting, getting a bunch of ACSMs and black carbon monitors and uh, even eventually UFPs, I actually kind of asked uh, a while back on Twitter, uh, you know, that I have 25,000 euros, what can I, what should I do with it? And uh, Marco Kulmala replied, said, you should get a, a CPC for doing UFP measurements. And, you know, obviously <laughs> yeah. uh, that, that's, that's Marco's thing. But on the other hand, it's not, it's, yeah. it's actually a really good point because there are no UFP measurements in any of these places. And we know from, I think our experiences, like the people have done these studies, for example, in China, even if it's a very polluted area, you can still have nucleation and that can be another source of pollution in these cities. Yeah, okay. so, 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 okay. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, I think uh, uh, please cut your answers a little bit shorter because I also at least have one. And maybe, Chan, if you then have also more, then uh, you can engage again. Okay. Uh, so, my question so, from my field, uh, there's a very interesting development out of Stanford uh, where people are actually building a planktoscope to um, uh, image plankton. And they made uh, the plants open source and they have it also very low cost. So it's, it's maybe 500 euro um, that people can build it. Um, are there plans to do something like that? Or can you imagine that? So that we also get more into a continuum of citizen science to institutional science so that, that really everyone can engage in this? Yeah, I think the, so, so one common easy answer, and I think this is very common in Europe and is, is uh, low cost sensors and DIY, right? Uh, like I think the Luftdaten project is there in Europe, for example, or the Purple Network, which is basically a bunch of people in a garage putting these sensors together. Uh, but, uh, but there are groups like Code for Africa, uh, which, actually, uh, which actually builds their own sensors. Uh, there is the Airco group in Makerere University. Uh, so, so that is led by engineer, uh, by, I will butcher his last name, but he goes by Bino on Twitter. And uh, so, but, but he is a computer science professor at Makerere University in Kampala. And uh, they just got more funding from Google to deploy their low cost sensors, which are the air co sensors in 10 cities across five countries. And we just had a conversation about how we can work with them uh, in Kenya and Ghana to start with. Uh, so, you know, I think, I think the, uh, I think one of the things to remember though is, you know, to me anyway, the interest really is not in building the sensor. Now I've done a lot of sensor characterization over the years. That's because I couldn't get the sensors to work the way I wanted them to. But my interest really is in air pollution. I want to look at the data and, you know, I mean, uh, this people really want to know what the air pollution is. They don't want, 
I mean, there are definitely people who want to build sensors and learn coding, and this is great, but that's probably not most of the people. They want to know air pollution. What am I breathing? Is it safe for me to go out? And so if we, if groups like ALCO and Code for Africa can standardize uh, the sensor manufacture and characterization so that you don't have to worry about data quality out of these devices, and then you can only look at the data, then that's then citizens can come in and host the sensors to their houses, for example, right? That's a really good use. And that's what we do in Pittsburgh. And we share the data with, with the ramp hosts, for example, and they get the monthly day, monthly reports and all that. So I think I, I'm definitely a proponent of commercial off the shelf units wherever possible. Uh, but obviously the role of citizen science is also important in terms of looking at the data, hosting the sensors, observational reports, okay, there is this waste burning going on near my site that can feed non-measurable data into your air pollution plan, right? And that's mm -hmm. really where it could be useful as well. Okay, excellent. There's uh, Alessandro Forte with his hand. Yes, thank you, Subu, for a very uh, stimulating talk and especially impressive effort to involve the local scientists. It's really wonderful. Nice to see that. I just have two quick questions. One, you identified the, the I don't know if it's a difficulty, but they obviously, in the case of Pittsburgh, the pollution sources obviously introduce a skewness across the network of stations. Some will record higher and others will record lower. So when you deploy the stations, are you consciously trying to account for the skewness based on potential pollution sources or do you just distribute them randomly? I'm not sure I understood that. So we do actually, there is a bit of intelligent design to the network uh, where, so when I, when I refer to land use regression uh, variables, so we, we know that traffic density is one potential source of pollution. Uh, we know that restaurants and are typical urban sources. Now we know actually a lot of work has been done mm -hmm. in Carnegie Mellon and other places over the recent years that find that the, as the, Coal, coal power plant pollution has decreased, these local urban sources become more prominent. And so we're looking at, tra we, we looked at traffic density, we looked at restaurant density, we look at uh, what are called environmental justice areas. These are areas where there are a greater fraction of uh, lower income groups or minority groups. And uh, they actually, usually for, you know, for historical reasons, uh, redlining among others, they end up being in really polluted neighborhoods as well. So we have tried to actually put the sensors there, but there is also a good bit of accidental, you know, opportunistic sampling uh, that we, uh, we make sure that we don't all, for example, one of the uh, comments I've heard from uh, Rebecca Garland is that, uh, and I hope, uh, you know, don't blame her if I misquote her, but uh, the, the SACIS monitoring network is typically a is, is, is expected to be at higher pollution locations. Uh, but we, so there are monitoring networks that do that. We have tried not to do that because when you want to build a land use regression model, you want areas with low traffic density, high traffic density, low restaurant count, high restaurant count. So you can actually account for that variability and the impact of that variable on pollution. So there is a bit of intelligent design there. Uh, but we definitely have tried to put more monitors in environmental justice areas, which by definition are places where there's likely to be more pollution as well. You also made the important comment about data and how the importance of data, obviously the techniques and the instruments are important as well, but how has this data, uh, this is a policy question, and I'm sorry to lead you into perhaps an area that's more uncomfortable, but it's one that I always wonder about. Scientists have been collecting data for 50 years on climate change. Lots of data, and I, I think you know where I'm going with this. Um, what have we done with that? Uh, I'm curious, has this data, air quality data, had an impact on the, some of the decision makers in some of these areas when they see some of these frightening particular uh, counts and so on? Have, have you seen some feedback? Yeah, no, I think I think that that's actually a very good question, that, and you're right. I mean, well, I mean, I wouldn't say that you know the climate science data has been collected and not gone anywhere, right? I mean, we write a lot of reports, and there's a lot of the Paris Climate Agreement came around because of it. Uh, it all feeds into that, uh, but it takes a lot of effort, right? I mean, uh, some might say that uh, you know Jim Hansen and the others knew about uh, about climate change in 1988, right? But it took till the last few years to actually get any reasonable action on that. It takes a long time. 
uh, systems do not change easily. Uh, that being said, the one thing that I do like is that uh, in Rwanda, uh, for example, uh, there wasn't any long-term monitoring in Kigali before we made our measurements. But once we did that, again, we worked with Jimmy Gasore and uh, they, the Rwanda Environmental Management Authority then put out their own air quality monitoring network. And they put one reference monitoring station and about 10 of the ramps. They bought 10 ramps from the company, put it around this country. So they looked at the hybrid network as a cost-effective way of improving air quality monitoring. And that data is now publicly available on their website. And uh, what are they doing with it? I mean, that might be up to the local municipalities to actually do something about it. Uh, but I know that the Rwandan government has taken some important initiatives like they recently are electrifying all their bikes. So if you go to any of these cities, there are a lot of motorcycle taxis that are quite polluting. And so the Rwandan government has actually started electrifying all of these bikes. And so you know that you know that uh, that uh, that reduces local pollution, also has you know impacts for for the climate. Uh, and so those are sorts of the things. But a lot of other places don't even have this data. Right, and so I know that the Ghana EPA is working with the US EPA and others uh, to actually start uh, deploying networks of sensors. They've got a couple of years of data; they want to start looking at it. Uh, but it'll take it'll take some time, and uh, uh, you know we are hopeful that uh, you know I think uh, again this is probably something that you know we would like to see change now, right? But I mean. I think we need a company. I think again, the other thing is these are low cost sensors, right? I mean, if you go to the US now, right? Even in the US, uh, like AQ and the EPA, I mean, all of these great places, the EPA is now using low cost sensors to, for, to look at uh, fire impacts, right? As a quick response tool. Uh, but regulators cannot really use low cost sensor data, right? Because that's how the laws are written. And uh, the, the, the data quality has to be certain, uh, certain respects, the data completion has to be this, and there's like 7% accuracy, which low cost sensors do not need. There's a lot, lot of, you know, uh, there's a lot of built-in uh, obstruction to the use of low cost sensors to making regulatory changes in the US. Maybe the EU is becoming a little more open now. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think in places like, uh, you know, Ghana and Kodawa and uh, Kenya, where there is a dearth of regulatory monitors, uh, we are hopeful that now the conversations are ongoing to actually, you know, get data quality as good as possible from the low cost sensors and use that to implement policy changes. And that's where the conversation should be headed. And it is being had in several of these, uh, you know, communities.